Yeah, nice. A very good evening, everyone. Welcome to iFocus Online, Lecture Two Twenty Five, Number Twelve from our series on uh, squint and pediatric ophthalmology. Today we have with us Professor Subhash Dadia sir from Guru Nanak Eye Center, Maulana Azad Medical College, New Delhi, talking to us on amblyopia, its pathogenesis, terminologies, clinical features, and evaluation. Our chair for the evening are uh, Dr. Pradeep Sharma sir and Dr. A K Amitava. Uh, sir, and I welcome uh, Dr. Pradeep Sharma, sir, to please welcome and introduce our speaker for the evening. Thank you, Shafali. It's really a pleasure to be on this twelfth lecture on the strabismus and pediatric ophthalmology module, which I think we should thank Santosh to have started such a, a great feast for education. And we have none other than Professor Subhash Dadia, whose uh, interest in amblyopia is really remarkable. He has had his medical education from Rohtak and then post graduation from RP Center Ames and then senior residency Guru Nanak Eye Center MAMC and then he has been working as a faculty and currently is the director professor of ophthalmology. He has been an active member of Strabismological Society of India, running through the various posts and finally being the president of Strabismus uh, and Pediatric Ophthalmology Society of India in 2016 and 17. He was also the chief editor of Indian Journal of Strabismology and Pediatric Ophthalmology from 2011 to 14. He has been the active organizing secretary of annual conference of SSI organized in 2008 at MAMC and a member of Asia Pacific Society of Pediatric Ophthalmology and Strabismus and also of IESA. He has been an active member of DOS and he has also been the president finally in 2017 and 22. He's been an active member of AIOS and has written a CME series on amblyopia. And so he's well placed in delivering us this lecture on amblyopia uh, and its evaluation and management. So he has more than 100 publications of credit in various uh, journals and uh, has made many presentations. He has been the secretary during his MBBS course, as well as the RDA president in AIMS and president and secretary faculty association of MAMC and associated hospitals. So I think over to Subhash, he is a wonderful speaker on the subject of amblyopia. So we would like to listen to him. Uh, respected sir, uh, Dr. Pradeep Sharma sir, thank you for your kind introduction. I am thankful to Dr. Santosh Hunawar, Center for Sight, for inviting me to speak on eye focus. Uh, thankful to Dr. Amitava sir, and uh, uh, thanks to Sefali. And uh, without wasting uh, time, I will be coming directly to the topic. This is close to my heart. So basically, amblyopia is derived from Greek word, which means dull vision. And according to Hippocrates, when patient and doctor sees nothing, the diagnosis is amblyopia. Technically, we can call it as neurodevelopment anomaly. Developing visual system fails to transmit a sharp retinal image to the visual cortex. It results in physiological alteration in visual pathway and impaired vision in one eye and less commonly both. Severity is related to degree of imbalance between two eyes and age at which amblyogenic factors occur. If they occur at early stage, then greater is the deficit and has far-reaching effects on development of visual system. Prevalence of amblyopia is 2 to 4% in children and onset is usually from birth to 7 years of age. After reflective error, it is most common cause of vision loss in infants and young ch children, and it is most common cause of monocular blindness in population below 40 years of age. So, does amblyopia affect other aspects of life? The reduction in stereopsis can be associated with reduced fine and gross motor skills. Children who are treated for amblyopia may have lower social acceptance. There is low self-esteem, negative self-image, feeling of depression, frustration. They have been reported. So it is very important to treat amblyopia. So basically, today we will be covering 
डेफिनेशन ऑफ हमलायोपिया पैथोफिजियोलॉजी टर्मिनोलॉजी यूज क्लिनिकल फीचर्स एंड इवेलुएशन हमलायोपिया इज क्लिनिकली डिफाइंड एज यूनिलेटरल आर बाइलेटरल reduction in best corrected stental visual acuity which is caused by foam vision deprivation and or abnormal binocular interaction without any visible organic cause and this decrease in visual acuity is as a result of lack of clear image projecting on retina anything that interfere with formation of clear retinal image will produce amblyopia the visual acuity should be less than 612 for bilateral amblyopia and there should be difference of two or more lines for unilateral amblyopia and most important thing is it is correctable if appropriate measures are applied at appropriate time what are the drawbacks of this definition because this definition is based on the visual acuity it does not take into account the qualitative differences which amblyopic patients experience like impaired contrast sensitivity impaired stereo acuity impaired reading ability furthermore amblyopia remains diagnosis of exclusion then who are the patient who are at risk for development of amblyopia unilateral amblyopia is usually associated with strabismus and it is more common in isotropes as compared to exotropes patients with high refractive error if there is hypermetropia of more than 3.5 diopter and if there is astigmatism of more than 1.5 diopter you must suspect amblyopia in those patients in patients of microtropia and small angle iso deviations you must rule out amblyopia patients who are having congenital cataract ptosis other media opacities these are high amblyogenic factors and in these patients we must rule out amblyopia bilateral cataract and opacities if there is family history of amblyopia and squint premature babies and if there is delayed neurological and visual maturation of unclear etiology so in all these category of patients we must rule out amblyopia what is pathophysiology of amblyopia basically differentiation organization and development of visual pathway are far from complete at birth during 2 to 3 years of life neuro retina develops rapidly in response to visual stimuli and this continues slowly till 8 to 9 year of age if there is sensory deprivation our brain receives a degraded image due to abnormal ocular alignment or deprivation then development is halted which leads to decrease in vision and if image quality is restored then development runs its normal course so most important thing for a pathophysiology of amblyopia is either there is sensory deprivation or brain receives a degraded image then very important term is critical period pupil and visal they point the term it is a period of time in early life during which the visual system shows liability of deprivation and ability for reversal of effects of deprivation it is the time period when developing visual system is sensitive to abnormal inserts so during critical period if there is abnormal insert which is caused by either stimulus stimulus deprivation strabismus or significant refractive error that can leads to amblyopia this critical period usually begin at about 4 month of age probably it passes its peak by 3 years is well down by 6 year and 
thereafter it undergoes a slow decline to cease by about 12 year of age now uh, some studies they question that it does not cease by 12 year of age so effect of deprivation it varies it is more profound if it occurs in first three months then after six months critical period also varies with different visual functions stereo acuity and fusion emerges and mature in first three months while special resolution continues to develop up to three years of age so basically which function is more affected that depends upon the time of injury during critical period if coordinated signals are not provided to the cortex before 2 to 3 years of age binocular connections in brain cannot be easily reestablished even if eyes are aligned successfully so time period is very important however neural connections in brain remains modifiable for a limited period of time normally the brain receives two images at a slightly different angle and it combines them to produce a 3d image in amblyopia to avoid diplopia the brain ignores one image and eye with poor vision becomes weak amblyopia can be treated because the brain has plasticity and this plasticity is modifiable at any age then three periods in development of vision sensitive period is from 3 month to 7 year the time in which visual experiences have profound effect on cortex and which makes it susceptible to amblyopia and it is a broad term which incorporates critical period post critical period and this critical period is up to 5 year of age and neural circuit is under development and it is the most vulnerable period and a specific subset where normal binocular intact input and visual experiences are absolutely necessary for subsequent normal functioning post critical period is 5 to 7 year of age here neural circuits have developed but visual function has matured and it is vulnerable to amblyopia and amenable to treatment then plastic period is 7 to 12 year and beyond and visually mature system with low plasticity where recovery is possible it is very important because irrespective of age the trial of occlusion or dioptic therapy should be given in any patient of amblyopia then in the pathophysiology there is role of amblyogenic stimulus there is role of retina and active cortical inhibition if there is light deprivation and form or pattern deprivation meaning thereby there is prevention of light stimulus from reaching to retina and it is monocular in strabismic and isometropic stimulus deprivation unilateral complete process unilateral media opacities like cataract corneal opacities and vitreous sandals and this <laughs> deprivation is binocular in bilateral media opacities ametropia etc and if there are more contributing factors then worse is the amblyopia then what is the role of retina there is decreased sensitivity of foveal cones in amblyopia and there is reduced input from rods and cones in the affected eye that causes certain neurophysiological changes which are transmitted to cns which triggers amblyopia then there are two type of cells they are parvocellular or known as p cells and magnocellular or m cells these p cells they are concentrated mostly in foveal area and parafoveal area and they are associated with 
fine visual acuity, fine stereopsis, color vision, and larger representation in cell three cortex. While M cells, they are in the peripheral retina and they are responsible for gross stereopsis, moment recognition, and they have smaller representation. So basically, whenever there is a stimulus, the stimulus passes from the retina through the optic nerves, optic chiasma, little geniculate nucleus, and the <clears throat> stimulus is received in primary visual cortex, that is layer four of V1 area. And if there is any obstruction in this visual pathway, then that leads to amyloidia. So basically for development of visual functions, three fundamental conditions are critical. There should be adequate stimuli. There must be ocular parallelism that is corresponding images should be there. And there should be integrity of visual pathway. And disturbances in visual input in any of these during <clears throat> critical period leads to development of amyloidia. Then there are alternate columns of ocular dominance columns which overlap uh, and area indicates binocular inputs. And this ocular dominance column, they segregate. And this segregation starts from three to four months and it is mature by three years. Thus, this period needs normal binocular interaction for functioning. Then what are the cortical changes in myopia? There is shrinkage in respective ocular dominance columns. The dominant columns encroach on the territory of weaker eyes. There is reduced metabolism and cortical blood flow in areas representing weaker ocular dominance columns. So basically you see in amyopic eye, there is lesser ocular dominance column as compared to the normal eye in this area. So in amyopia, basically ocular dominance preferences, they are reallocated from amyopic eye to better seeing eye resulting in under representation of amyopic eye. And in anisometropia, there is defocused image which leads to selective loss of neurons which are sensitive to fine details. Then what are the terminologies which are associated with amyopia? The classification of amyopia is starbismic, anisometropic, deprivational, refractive, meridional, organic, occlusion, and <clears throat> some authors, they include toxic uh, uh, amyopia also. So, what is there in the starbismic amyopia? In <clears throat> starbismic amyopia, basically, there are two mechanisms. Starbismus leads to lack of adequate stimulation of fovea of the deviated eye, which leads to amyopia. The image from deviated eye is suppressed by brain as an adaptation to avoid diplopia. It is most common cause of amyopia and it is usually associated with constant non-alternating type of the star business. It is more commonly seen in isotropes as compared to the exotropes and severity of amyopia does not collaborate with angle of star business. So basically, there are two clear images, they fuse, they produce one image that is normal phenomena. If there is blurry image, which is sent by BKI, it is ignored, that is leads to suppression. And if only one image is sent, that is there in amyloidia. Anisometropic amyopia. This condition is thought to result partly from direct effect of image blur 
in development of visual acuity and partly from intraocular competition or inhibition basically in anisometropic amblyopia the eye of a child usually looks normal and and, and hence this type of amblyopia is commonly missed it is second most common cause of amblyopia hypermetropic anisometropia is more amblyopogenic as compared to the myopic anisometropia because in myopia the child has a clarity of vision for near so hypermetropic anisometropia is more amblyogenic and these hypermetropic children they have increased risk of strabismus and amblyopia and amount of anisometropia that can induce amblyopia varies according to type of refractive error then isometropic amblyopia it results from large approximately equal uncorrected bilateral refractive error and basically it is because of effect of blood retinal image it is commonly due to high hypropia or astigmatism and at least 4.5 diopter of hypropia or 2.5 diopter of astigmatism is required to produce this sort of amblyopia it is also seen in cases of high myopia usually in uh, patients who have refractive error of more than 6 dab and this type of isometropic amblyopia it has best prognosis then another variety of amblyopia is deprivational amblyopia it was also known as amblyopia ex anoxia or disuse amblyopia it is least common but it is most damaging type of amblyopia it is caused by total lack of pattern congenital cataract vitreous hemorrhage corneal opacities congenital ptosis and this deprivational amblyopia has worst prognosis then another terminology is occlusion amblyopia this occlusion amblyopia is type of deprivational amblyopia it is caused by excessive therapeutic patching and usually it is reversible on stopping the patching organic amblyopia is amblyopia which is superimposed on an irreversible ocular anomaly that causes visual impairment it is usually difficult to diagnose outcomes are usually worse and most common conditions which are associated are retinal and optic nerve anomalies then some also include toxic amblyopia those some call is it has toxic optic neuropathy so then then certain drugs like chloramphenicol and ethambutol tobacco use of tobacco alcohol use of chemicals like methanol and nutritional like vitamin a deficiency have also been incorporated by some in the category of toxic amblyopia then what is severity of amblyopia as defined by ats it mild amblyopia is visual acuity that is 20 by 40 moderate amblyopia is visual acuity 20 by 42 to 20 by 200 and severe amblyopia visual acuity of less than 20 by 200 
then how do you diagnose amblyopia for diagnosis of amblyopia three things are very essential first is there should be evidence of reduced visual acuity and this visual acuity is less than 612 for bilateral amblyopia and for unilateral amblyopia there should be difference of more than two line between amblyopic eye and normal eye then second important point is there must be amblyo presence of amblyogenic factors and thirdly there should not be any alternate cause for visual loss so it is very important to carry out complete ocular examination before labeling a patient as amblyopia and until and unless these three conditions are fulfilled we should not label a patient as amblyo multiple assessment using a variety of test are performed on different occasions and they are sometimes required to make a final judgment concerning the presence and severity of amblyopia then what are the clinical features of amblyopia the foremost important is decrease in best corrected visual acuity so hallmark of amblyopia is decreased foveal acuity as i have already stated best corrected visual acuity of 612 are worse in the amblyopic eye or difference of two or more line between amblyopic and normal eye then another important feature of amblyopia is the acuity of amblyopic eye is better under scotopic conditions than photopic conditions second most important feature of amblyopia is if there is defective stereo acuity in those cases we must carry out further investigations to rule out amblyopia then most important point for preverbal children is fixation preference so fixation preference for one eye suggest amblyopia in preverbal children and it remains one of the most valuable clinical method for diagnosis of amblyopia in preverbal children in small angle deviations the induced propia test of 10 10 prism diopter is more specific and determining whether amblyopia is present or not in preverbal children is a challenging task and this very simple uh, test of fixation preference for one eye is very important for diagnosis of amblyopia in preverbal children then another important feature of amblyopia is crowding phenomena basically when the child is tested with isolated letters rather than lines or groups there is improved visual acuity which is specific to amblyopia and it has a prognostic indication then if you place a neutral density filter before a amblyopic eye the vision might improve in a amblyopic eye color vision is usually normal however color vision defects are seen in dense amblyopia 
contrast sensitivity, especially of high frequency, is decreased in starbismic amblyopia. And decreased contrast sensitivity of all frequencies is seen in anisometropic amblyopia. Some visual field losses can also be seen in amblyopia. Accommodation may be defective in some cases. RAPD is occasionally present in amblyopic patients. Eccentric fixation is present in many patients of amblyopia. And if you perform OCT, <coughs> there is macular increase in the macular thickness. And functional MRI can detect cortical deficits in amblyopia. Then for evaluation of amblyopia, basically amblyopia is usually asymptomatic and therefore can easily avoid detection. And most of the parents, they bring the child to ophthalmologist due to underlying cause of amblyopia like process starbismus. Unilateral anisometropic amblyopia commonly goes undetected. So in the history, we should ask in the birth history, especially we should ask for history of prematurity, history of vision problems, then what is the duration of symptoms, then we must ask history of use of glasses in the child and the family. We must ask treatment history and its duration, history of delayed milestones, systemic history like cerebral palsy, Down syndrome. Complete pediatric evaluation is mandatory. We must ask family history of amblyopia. We must ask age of onset and the interval between onset and presentation and history of prior treatment and what has been its response, whether it is improved, same status or worsened. And very important is education and motivation of parents is very important because the Treatment is usually prolonged, so educational status and motivational status of parents is very important and must be asked. Then, what are the clues for amblyopia? It is a significant health problem. So, if there is fixation preference, if there is tilting of head, if there is rubbing of eyes, abnormal high blink rate. If there is resistance for occlusion of the sound eye, then that is very important sign of amblyopia. Drifting of eyes when child is tired or sick. Closure of one eye in sunlight. Examination of objects close to eye and presence of amblyogenic factors. So if any of these are present, we must rule out amblyopia in these children. As appropriate visual acuity testing should be done. We must record the power of current spectacles if the person is using. Cycloplegic reflection and subjective refinement wherever possible is very important. Bruckner's test should be carried out, pupillary reactions must be noted, stereopsis must be tested and assessment of fixation pattern should also be done. We 
should always look for process any lead hemangioma or any corneal opacities or cataract or any other lesion that could affect the visual pathway anterior segment examination must be done we must carry out motility and ocular alignment examination we must rule out strabismus microtropia we must look for nystagmus and fundus examination is mandatory basically this bruckner's test is done it is similar to distant direct ophthalmoscopy at two feet in the dark room and basically simultaneously we view red glow in both eyes and we must look for asymmetry if red glow is asymmetrical then there must be either an isometropia or there must be brighter reflex in deviating eye in the strabismus so <clears throat> this uh, visual acuity testing has already been covered uh, by previous speakers uh, in the previous lectures so is appropriate visual acuity testing must be done and in our setting most of the patients they are not so educated so pictures chart landot c chart and in older children snellen chart they are uh, to be commonly used test for stereopsis two pencil test is very important for stereopsis other wise in intelligent patient you can carry out it must fly test trend dot stereogram and work for dot test if there is central steady and maintained fixation that implies good vision if there is freely alternate fixation amblyopia is unlikely but presence of eccentric fixation signifies deep amblyopia so so these are the diagnostic criteria which has been used by american academy of ophthalmology like for unilateral amblyopia response to monocular occlusion there is asymmetrical objection fixation preference there is failure to initiate or maintain fixation preferential looking there is intraocular difference of two or more octaves and best corrected visual acuity there is intraocular difference of two or more lines so these are the diagnostic criteria for unilateral amblyopia which has been used by american academy of ophthalmology and for bilateral amblyopia is 3 to 4 years visual acuity worse than 20 by 50 is 4 to 5 years visual acuity worse than 20 by 40 and is more than less than 5 visual acuity which is worse than 20 by 30 so basically we have to identify the children who are at risk for amblyopia we have to diagnose amblyopia at earliest possible stage identify the etiology of amblyopia inform the family about disease and treatment plans start the treatment at the earliest limit the effect of amblyopia on quality of life employment and career reevaluate the patient and revise the treatment as and when necessary Thank you very much. Thank you so much, sir. That was an excellent talk. I'm sure uh, our PGs will definitely benefit from it. Uh, Pradeep Sharma, sir, Amitava, sir, and also we welcome Minakshi, ma'am, uh, to our panel today for discussion. Hi, ma'am. Welcome. We can start with Dr. Minakshi for any comments first. Hi, uh, hi everybody. Yeah. Uh, good evening, and uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Pradeep Sharma, and thank you, uh, uh, Dr. Shafali. Uh, Dr. Subhash uh, Dadia has very, very comprehensively covered all the important aspects of uh, diagnosis of amblyopia. What are the etiological factors? The diagnostic criteria. which is uh, very important when you sit there out, out as a general ophthalmologist i just wanted to add only a couple of uh, points for the postgraduates the first one is that even if you cannot 
examine a child comfortably, a very a young kid, for example, with either a cataract or um, say a corneal opacity or, or ptosis, one can presume that there is amblyopia. So once you have resumed, once you have taken care of the amblyogenic factor, because it's very uh, not very uncommon to see the cataract is removed, after which the patient is just uh, left with, uh, you know, uh, intraocular lenses, uh, you know, uh, reading glasses given and then bye-bye. The, and very much later, when the child is five or six years of age, when the child starts going to school or undergoes vision screening is when uh, the amblyopia, the deprivation amblyopia comes to light. And so important uh, take home message to remember is that in all deprivation amblyopia, even if you cannot test, if the child is too small, child is resisting, uh, may not resist occlusion, presume that there is amblyopia whenever, whenever there's visual deprivation and go after it and treat it as soon as the cause of deprivation is removed. The second important uh, test that uh, is, often, is often very useful is something called the induced tropia test. And what is the, and the induced tropia test is particularly uh, useful when you are dealing with say anisometropic amblyopia in the absence of any strabismus. So, because when you have strabismus, you can easily do the central steady maintain uh, uh, test and uh, be able to pick up amblyopia. Whereas if you have anisometropic amblyopia and uh, especially a younger children who, a young child who does not read, so then you use a vertical base down prism in front of either eye. If the eye is, has amblyogenic, is suppressed, the child will not notice, the eye will not notice the shift in the image that the prism will induce. Whereas the normal eye, moment you put a base down prism in front of it, is going to shift to take up uh, fixation because of the shift in the image. So this is a, a very useful test to practice and to use regularly, particularly in pre-verbal children to detect anisometropic amblyopia. Thank you. Thank you so much for uh, having me. Dr. Amitava, any comments? Uh, just one that uh, I think one of the frontiers that we have paid less attention to over the years is the fact that uh, they are poor accommodators, these eyes. And very often I've seen that uh, some of my colleagues, they put in an intraocular lens, even in a small child. And um, they haven't thought of the fact that the, the, the child, uh, you know, these eyes, because they haven't been able to see clearly. So accommodation, basically the stimulus is blur. But these eyes, which have never seen clearly, they can't appreciate further blurring at near. Even if you've given uh, the, the clear, uh, uh, the refractive connection for distance. So I believe that we must, uh, that is one of the frontiers which has been neglected over the years. Uh, and we should uh, be careful enough that, and small children particularly, their, their uh, world is much closer to them. So I'm not too sure uh, where, when people give, you know, there's no point of giving that one-year-old child uh, a, a distant correction, you know, for far. Because he's got, most of his life is close by. It's better to give it for half a meter, which is the more functional distance for the child. I think that should be kept in mind. Thank you, Dr. Minakshi and Dr. Amitabha. So I think uh, carrying on with what Dr. Subhash has mentioned, uh, we would like to just highlight certain more points. One is that in amblyopia, we are talking of visual acuity as the prime thing because it's the most easily detectable test. But that is not the only thing. Amblyopia has actually uh, involved all the other visual functions, including contrast sensitivity, which Dr. Subhash also mentioned. And even other uh, things like vernier equity, like uh, the speed of reading. Now, speed of reading is something which is a very subjective thing, but very useful in your clinical examination of a child. When you are following up a child and when you are asking him to read the chart, it's not the end point that how many uh, letters he has read or what line he has read. He may read 612, but he may be reading slower than a normal child it implies that there is still a amblyopia which is working. So he may read six by six. You may feel that he's okay, but no, the speed of reading is also something. So that's one reason why I keep on saying that visual equity assessment in a child needs to be done by the clinician himself and not by the optometrist or some other person who's doing, who is not recording these points. So either, I mean, we should be noting the speed of reading. And when we are following up a child on occlusion therapy, you will find this, improving along with that. 
The second thing, as Dr. Amitabha has highlighted, is the uh, problem of accommodation, the accommodation lag or accommodation inability, which some children may have, and they may require um, the uh, correction of near correction, little more ad has to be given in some of these children. But you will also find that the reading ability of near is improved first. So that will be the earlier improvement in occlusion therapy that we'll see. So don't forget to read, uh, check the near visual equity in these children when you are examining. The third point, point I'd like to highlight is, as Dr. Minakshi was saying about the amblyopogenic cause. So whenever you have an amblyopogenic cause, think of amblyopia, that is what she was trying to highlight. I would also put it from the other point of view, that don't ever diagnose an amblyopia unless you have a definitive amblyopogenic cause. Just any person having diminution of vision should not be put into the uh, bin of amblyopia. You need to answer yourself, why is that? So if you do not have that relevant thing which is there, you re-question yourself, look into the optic nerve, look for other causes of macular problems. Don't put it in the dustbin of uh, amblyopia or put him on treatment for occlusion therapy, just like that. You need to first reassure yourself that yes, it is a functional amblyopia and not an organic problem which may not be fully uh, responding to it. So you may subject a person to an occlusion without knowing this and he may keep on using occlusion at the uh, I mean, uh, sad part and he may end up with two or three months later that no, it could not be improved. And for the same reason, always peep into the fundus, look, at, look into the fixation. How good is the fixation? Is it central, steady, eccentric? All these points will help you in assessing whether there is an amblyopia. So I think these are the points. If there are any questions, Dr. Shefali, from the uh, people, let's address those now. Yes, sir. Few questions are there. Uh, the first one is in cases of unilateral total congenital cataract or severe congenital ptosis, can you please explain what duration of stimulus deprivation would lead to amblyopia? Okay. Dr. Subhash, would you uh, like to answer that? What is the question? Kindly repeat. Uh, in case of unilateral total congenital cataract or severe congenital ptosis, can you please explain what duration of stimulus deprivation would lead to amblyopia, sir? Basically, in these uh, patients, uh, the congenital cataract or ptosis, it should be removed at the earliest. At the earliest. Just to add, what we, I think the questioner is probably asking is the duration that would also depend upon the density of the cataract. So you may have, uh, let's say, a, a, a cataract or an opacification which is less than three millimeters. It may not cause um, any severe problem of amblyopia. So we need to see it's not just cataract as a diagnosis, but what is the area and the depth of that cataract is to be seen. That is one thing. Second is the duration. So the duration would depend upon the density of the cataract or in case of ptosis, whether it is covering the pupil, is it unilateral or bilateral? Mind you, if it is a bilateral ptosis, the child will uh, usually have the chin up in order to see, whereas unilateral suffers because he makes use of the good eye and the ptosis keeps on hiding the pupil and the vision. So that becomes more. And it has been seen that even as less as one week is enough to cause amblyopia. So there have been reports that uh, uh, later on uh, the amblyopia was detected and they found in the history that it was a brief period of one week in the early childhood which was responsible for this. So if a child has, let's say, a chalazion, a blephritis, which may have been treated later on, but if it is not being uh, I mean, corrected for this part, he may continue to have some difference in vision in the two eyes. So the duration may be just as less as one week if there is a dense problem. And uh, and if I may add to Dr. Uh, uh, Dr. Pradeep's point, it also depends on the age of the child. Correct. So the younger the child, the, the faster the amblyopia can set in. The visual system tends to be more sensitive to visual deprivation than an older child. So a total cataract that came on in a five-year-old may not be as amblyogenic as something that comes on, say a traumatic cataract that comes on at five or six months of age. So an age, and like Dr. Pradeep said, the location of the cataract, the more posterior the cataract, the more uh, the, the less you can see the red reflex. All these uh, things add up to say how amblyogenic this particular 
cash factors. Quite right. So I think what Subhash was earlier showing. And uni, 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 unilateral. Yeah. yeah, carry on, Subhash. Unilateral cataract is more amblyogenic as compared to the bilateral. So in the age, particularly, Dr. Subhash already mentioned the critical period. that it may be most uh, sensitive period in the early 3 months to 6 months and after that also it is sensitive till about 5 years and still uh, sensitive but lesser amount 5 to 7 years so these are the relatively critical periods so it is as dr minakshi was saying the age is very important so we need to see and for that reason you will find that anisometropic amblyopias are relatively better off than any strabismus or a cataract which is happening in the first year of life because refractive errors are usually coming up later on and isometropic amblyopias are usually in the later little later they have been shown to be improving even when we treat them in a relatively adult hood like maybe 20 years of age you have an anisometrop you may give occlusion and you will have good results i mean those success stories which are there are indicative of this fact that it was later in onset so any other question shifali Yes, sir. Uh, can you please explain the crowding phenomenon and its relevance in evaluation of amblyopia? I think sir had explained in one of his slides the crowding phenomenon while checking. So, uh, can you explain the uh, phenomenon again? And it's so basically, uh, as uh, I have told in uh, amblyopic patients, if uh, the crowding phenomena is there, then that is a prognostic indicator also, and that is a diagnostic point of amblyopia. Uh, is also there so if you test uh, the uh, letters in a row or uh, uh, then and uh, as compared to the letters in a single letters then uh, the visual acuity is better if you test uh, the single letters the visual acuity is better so if that uh, that is uh, one of the features of the amblyopia i'm not able to hear you Amita, was there anything you would want to add? Yeah, I think uh, this what the person perhaps wants to know is why is it happening. So basically, the uh, pers- uh, the amblyops uh, system is not being able to uh, you know delineate each letter when it's crowded around with a lot of other letters around, and that is why uh, I mean it's, it's it's I think possibly like a higher fu- visual function deficit. It's almost a higher visual function deficit, more caught co- more like a cerebral problem, and they can't differentiate. So if you give them crowded letters or same in single line letters they don't perform so well but if you give them isolated letters they tend to be be better at that so that's how it can be explained actually if you see the physiology of vision there are on areas and off areas so when you see in the center there has to be an on and the adjoining areas are the off areas in people who have amblyopia these areas are larger in size and so they will have more contour interaction which is detrimental to the visual acuity of the central area so this is the reason why we have a crowding phenomenon in so to say that amblyops are actually having in the center as if they are seeing in the peripheral part in the peripheral part the on areas of areas are larger whereas in the uh, fovea they are much smaller finite areas which are giving you more clear uh, vision and we can have the better resolution in the fovea but in amblyopia we are seeing that the effect like what you have in the periphery is in there also in the center so as we said it's not just visual acuity it is also the other function like here it's a contour interaction which is creating a crowding phenomenon the other functions are also there like the contrast sensitivity and the uh, the effect of the other cells which are uh, in the nearby areas are causing this Uh, Dr. Minakshi, would like to say something? Yeah, I just wanted to say the one of the practical aspects of whatever uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Pradeep and, uh, and the others have discussed uh, is that you know it's tempting when a child doesn't read in the clinic is mm-hmm. to just put a, put your hand and occlude the other letters to isolate each letter to show the child. So it is very tempting to do this, but then you will artificially record better vision because you have taken care of the crowding phenomenon. artificially so this is something to be uh, aware of not to go and you know isolate the letter to ask uh, you know the child to read better that is why if you see in most of the studies when they have used single optotypes they have always put surround bars to take care of the like lines around the single letter single optotype in uh, all the studies that were you that uh, pedic did the amblyopia treatment studies so it's important 
to be cautious when you test in clinic? Uh, Dr. Minachi, basically, uh, we are uh, not using it as uh, for the purpose of uh, recording of the visual activity. Basically, uh, we are uh, once we are recording the vision, we are uh, recording it with all the letters. But uh, this isolated uh, are the crowding phenomena we are testing only for uh, finding out whether uh, basically it is uh, diagnostic for myopia and uh, secondly, it has a prognostic indicator. So for that purpose, for recording purpose, we are uh, using uh, uh, the letters in a row. Hmm. No, what Dr. Minakshi was saying was that sometimes you use say, the chart uh, for the said, ease of the yeah. child being able to uh, communicate, but to yes. have a simulation of amblyopia crowding phenomenon, you have these single letters with surrounds or yes. even the pictures which are having surrounds so that we can detect amblyopia. Otherwise, we'll miss amblyopia. That was the point of Minakshi. Yeah, yes. But, you know, uh, just one more thing that uh, as far as the visual equity is concerned, even uh, using a finger, sometimes, you know, you students tend to walk across and, you know, say, Ye, what is this letter and what is this letter? Even that finger pointing can improve visual equity. Yeah, that is like uh, uh, making him fix it better. Uh, to see, in uh, you may, uh, uh, I think, sort of understand it, like a person having a very good focus can do, even if there is some distraction, but amblyopia is a situation in which slight distractions make the vision uh, poor. So these uh, surrounding letters that cause a detriment. Anything else which uh, distracts them also uh, reduces the vision. So I think focusing, as Dr. Amitava is saying, helps in making them uh, fixate or focus on one particular letter. So another one is among the amblyogenic stimuli, uh, for example, the form, vision deprivation, or the light deprivation, which amongst them is the most potent factor for development of amblyopia? The form, uh, vision de deprivation, or light deprivation? It is form, vision deprivation. I mean, light deprivation also is an further extension. I mean, form yes, is sir. having a better, but light deprivation, if it is like just total darkness, that would be still more worse. So, like if there's a total cataract, then it will be a light deprivation. So, that is why the term used was stimulus deprivation to cover both uh, form de deprivation versus a light deprivation. So, it's a stimulus deprivation and lapia nowadays the term is used. So, that I think covers both. But yes, light deprivation is definitely, if it is indicating just uh, having light on and off light, then it is much more detrimental. I mean, I mean it's very simple. Uh... I mean, form is also some light is reaching in a, in a form. So, light deprivation means there can't be any form at all. Correct. So, it's more words. And uh, so another is re related to, to the Bruckner's reflex. In interpretation of the Bruckner's reflex, uh, can you please explain the basis of formation of superior and inferior crescents in myopia and hypermetropia? Uh, so, Bhasha, would you like to take that question? Uh, kindly repeat the question. In interpretation of Bruckner's reflex, can you yeah. please explain the basis of formation of superior and inferior crescents in myopia and hypermetropia? That, that is basically because of the asymmetric of, uh, of the reflexes. Amitava, sir, any comments? You know, it's interesting if you use your ophthalmoscope and if you get a superior crescent and if you rotate your ophthalmoscope, you'll see the crescent will also become, uh, will rotate. Uh, so if you get like, uh, say in, in myopia, you, I, you get inferior brighter crescents. Uh, and if you rotate your ophthalmoscope vertically and hold the handle up, you will see that the crescent has, has reversed. So there is, I mean, it's not exactly coaxial actually, but the light and the, uh, from what you're seeing. So therefore, the crescents can change. If you're using, a, I mean, we were using a camera where the positioning of the light and the recording was slightly different from the uh, ophthalmoscope. So we were getting, you know, opposite crescents. And I remember uh, talking to people of the PD group. And then we, t I, I tried turning around my ophthalmoscope and I found all these crescents actually changing direction. So if somebody is going to hold the ophthalmoscope for some reason, you know, a little on the side, you, he will get a different crescent. So this is basically to do with the uh, you know little offsetting 
of the light and uh, the uh, where exactly the rays are coming to your eye. That's right. Actually, it's an off-axis camera positioning, which is the basis of Bruckner's reflex. And the same is also for the photo screeners. They are also made on the same principle. So if you have an off-axis camera, this is what is work. In fact, we were working on this in the uh, with some of the colleagues in the Stanford Institute of Biodesign for creating that. And that is how it is done. So the, the difference between that, that's how you can actually gauge the amount of refractive error also. Yes. Also tell you how much because of the how much is the off axis discrepancy that can be computed by the computer and that will tell you the refractive error also. So the auto refractors, some of them are using this principle in order to judge the amount of refractive error. So it's an off axis discrepancy which is there. And so the last one, uh, what is the basis of neutral density filter test in evaluation of amblyopia? Basically, the visual activity improves uh, if you put a neutral density filter in front of the amblyopic eye, while in normal situations, it decreases. So that is one of the diagnostic criteria uh, for the amblyopic patients. So as he had described that the mesopic vision is better than photopic vision in amblyopias. So uh, by giving a neutral density filter, you are simulating a mesopic vision. So that's why the vision will improve. And this is similar to, as I said earlier, that what happens in the periphery, the mesopic vision. In the center, there's a photopic vision. In amblyopia, you are having the transfer. There's a mesopic vision is all coming in the central area also. So using neutral density filters in other conditions, other than amblyopia will actually reduce the visual activity. So if there's a maculopathy, if there's any optic neuropathy, if you give neutral density filters, it will cause less light to enter. So less visual activity will be there. But in amblyopia per se, because the mesopic vision is better than the photopic vision, the photopic is creating more of contrast and contour interaction. So it is disturbing the visual activity in amblyops. So it becomes better with the mesopic visual activity. So and neutral density filters are useful from that point of view. So is that all Shifali? Yes, sir. With this, I think we can wrap up the session for tonight. Uh, thank you so much, Subhash, sir, for this very complete talk on this very important topic. Actually, we all get patients in our clinic uh, with amplyopia. And thank you so much to Minakshi, ma'am, Amitava, sir, and Pradeep, sir, for your insights and inputs, as always. Thank you, Shefali, for conducting it very nicely, for moderating the session. And once again, I would like to thank uh, Subhash, Dr. Amitava, Dr. Minakshi, and of course, the man behind it, Dr. Santosh, for making it possible. So thank you all. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Bye -bye. Bye -bye. Next session, Bye -bye. I'll just tell about the next session. Uh, we'll be meeting on August 5th. Uh, the topic will be management of amblyopia by Dr. Santan Gopal, sir. So see you all on this Friday, August 5th. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.